everybody, it's Dr. Ron. I'm sitting here with, well, I'm actually standing here with, <laughs> uh, with Kylie Wong. And we're standing because this is the first time I'm interviewing someone that's the same height as me. So we get to stand. And uh, plus, you get to see the really cool stuff that's behind us. This is the newly opened Regen room. Correct. Right? Yep. And I assume Regen stands for regenerative. Correct. Absolutely. So, regenerative medicine. Yeah. So, this is kind of that component of kind of what I'm promoting and what I do. Yeah. So, here's what's interesting. So, you spent, what, nine seasons in mm -hmm. the NFL? Yep. And so, you know a thing or two about regeneration. Yes. Right? And not being injured and stuff like that, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first hand experience mm -hmm. uh, with probably yourself and your teammates and everything like that, right? And so, this is this is something that, um, that I want to get my head around. Okay. When we talk about regenerative, mm -hmm. is there really such a thing as regenerating body parts, tissues, joints? Is that like a thing? So regenerative, so regenerative, and, and this is actually a, a fundamental argument that I have a lot of times okay. with a lot of people, right? So regenerative medicine, everyone first, first thing they always think about is stem cells. Right. Yes, that is a component of regenerative medicine, but there is much more to um, you know regenerative medicine. Many times, people want think they want stem cells because they've heard about it. Okay. But that might not actually be the best treatment for you. When I say, when I truly say stem cells, I'm saying there's basically two forms of stem cells, okay. right? That is bone, basically bone marrow, yeah. right? And then also fat adipose tissue. Okay. Those are the two types of things that can be done. Okay. And so these are basically cells that exist um, within your body, like in your bone marrow, that's able to turn into other cells. Correct. And therefore, you know, we have this concept of, uh, of regeneration. Absolutely. Right? Able to turn into or influence, right? So that's also another big factor of, right. of the, their capabilities is their ability to influence and wake up right. other cells that may be a little bit dormant or may, maybe need to um, uh, basically say, hey, we got to do something. We got to do something about this. Okay. Wake up and let's do that. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're on an NFL team and you have this one dude that goes in there and that wakes everyone up. That's uh, and the hype man, the, the hype Ray man. Lewis that comes out of the, out of the <laughs> tunnel and now right. the whole team is absolutely crunk and ready to go. Right. That's kind of what we're talking about. Yes, yes exactly. So I think, you know, in, uh, most people have a misconception about stem cells. They think, well, we have these awesome cells and they turn mm -hmm. and divide into things. And I think what we, the new research really shows is that stem cells contain uh, uh, structures within the actual cell absolutely that influence the surrounding areas yep here's what else that's interesting this is the same concept of probiotics mm -hmm. so probiotics believe it or not when you take a probiotic the bacteria is not supposed to survive your body breaks down the bacteria that you take and then you utilize in the DNA as what's called an entourage effect kind of like your Ray Lewis yep. hype man your sort hype of man. person yep and so and so that's the thing that I really want to ask you is like, what really is regeneration? Is it the hype man philosophy or is it that the stem cells is really turning into other tissue? It is the hype man philosophy. Yeah. So if you think of the stem cell as a general contractor on a work site, okay. he doesn't necessarily have to lift a hammer to build a building, okay. right? Because he's going to be like, hey, you're doing this job, you do this job. He organizes it and all of a sudden a building is erected in, in the place that you wanted a building erected in the right way. Okay. Because it is the person that goes in and wakes stuff up and you know, and one of the ways that they do this is through um, what it kind of secretes from a stem cell, which are exosomes. Okay. And exosomes are those messages. Hey, you you know, these are the instructions to do this. These are the instructions to do that. And that's when your body um, kind of takes over and starts um, you know, being activated okay. to um, kind of create, start the regenerative process. Right, so the exosomes are kind of like the subcontractors then, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Where it's, uh, so the definition of exosomes, so exo means that it's exiting, it's exiting the stem cell. And ohm basically means genetic material or genetic mm -hmm. signaling. And so the exosome is basically, if you imagine a sphere that's exiting the actual stem cell that's able to communicate with the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there, are, and there are a lot of different uh, ways that nature has allowed this to happen, yeah, yeah. far beyond just stem cells and exosomes. Absolutely. So I talked about your gut bacteria, your gut microbiome, mm -hmm. okay? And then the other thing is that if you eat plants, 
mm -hmm. like greens and purples and reds and stuff like that your bacteria in your gut actually breaks down those actual colors right. called polyphenols okay in the in the phytonutrients and phytonutrients plant-based nutrients uh, which contains these polyphenols also have the similar effect that exosomes and stem cells have Absolutely. on the body and regeneration mm -hmm. is that these things actually affect the way uh, that genes are actually expressed mm -hmm. and so we see this sort of thing happen in nature so this is nothing that's like you know really scientifically out there right <coughs> it's just a Regeneration is part of a natural process that occurs. Without question. It's happening all day, every day. Right. And I mean, that's kind of one of the things that, you know, drew me to this as an alternative. So I've, I've been through a number of surgeries. We talked about my football background. Four, four surgeries, and I had way more to come. And wow. there were a, um, basically I was told that I was a great candidate, you know, laughingly, a great candidate for a lot of different joint replacements. And I was, I'm such a believer in your body's ability to heal itself. And in fact, that's really what medicine is doing. Mm -hmm. That I just, that's kind of how I discovered kind of the, the, the procedure for myself. And then ultimately kind of got involved in the regen room was uh, bringing that to everybody. Because what I have seen for so long is the advancements from medicine to everybody is typically 19 to 20 years, right? So like I was first introduced to PRP in 2001. That's kind of when some of my teammates were having it and we were, I was, you know, um, but you know, so I think PRP is platelet rich plasma. Sorry, right? yep, yep. Let's, let's define this a little Platelet, bit. Uh, platelet rich enriched plasma. So that's from blood, right? It is from your blood, absolutely. Okay. Um, not someone else's blood. Not at no. <laughs> own not. blood. Yes. So if you're if you're getting a PRP therapy, it's actually derived from your blood. Mm -hmm. It's your cells. It's your healing components that are in there. Right? Uh, centrifuge down and basically right. separated. The, right. the plasma is, is separated kind of from the red blood cells. So why did you hear about it in 2001, and why is this such a recent thing now? Exactly, and that's the point, right? So the typical progression is always uh, elite athlete has access to it. Um, then it goes to really, really rich people, mm -hmm. and then it kind of makes it its way to everybody else. Okay. And so the idea of, you know, when I had to figure out what I needed to do for my body to be proactive, to make sure that I move the way I want to and live the lifestyle that I wanted to, I had to reach out to guys that are current players, figuring out what they're doing, like what procedures are they doing? Okay. Because I knew that as a non-pro athlete, I just didn't have that access. I didn't have that network okay. anymore. And so the, the premise of that is there's amazing things that happen. And athletes are, are, are usually the first people to kind of have an opportunity to do this because for them, outcomes is everything. You know, if it works and does it work, does it get them back on the field? Does it allow them to, you know, avoid a surgery? Um, that is, you know, an immediate consequence to kind of their ability to earn money for their family yeah, um, yeah. and to do what they love. And so that's why they're always seem to be very cutting edge. And so now you have kind of brought whatever was available for the professional athletes to the rest of the popula uh, population, right? Correct. The one thing that was very clear to me and the reason why yes. you know, I got involved with the region room is I personally believe that regenerative medicine is amazing. And it did, it's done remarkable things for me. It's done remarkable things from a lot of my friends. And, you know, by and large, it's being led not by MDs. And so for me, that was a big, that was a big part of it is that this should, this is one of those things that should be, you know, MD led. Um, and, and that's kind of why, you know, we teamed up or not really teamed up, but we were hired um, by, you know, a, a doctor who was, you know, in the NBA, in the NHL, in the MLB, who's okay. been doing this for a long time, yeah. has, has made his practice around regenerative medicine because, you know, he has to be heard as well. Just like, you know, um, some of the great, you know, uh, medical, you know, companies that we have around in, in, in the city of Houston, mm -hmm. he should also be at the table saying, hey, look, there are sometimes alternatives. It, there is not a bad candidate for regenerative medicine, but there certainly is bad timing. And what I mean by that is, is you know, you could be too far um, and, and we're into structural stuff that just can't be can't be addressed by like regenerative medicine. Really bad arthritis and or, or ligament, yeah, ligament tears. tears, that type of stuff. Okay. Um, or or that's also we have to be real about this as well. Um, is if your body is not being well taken care of and yep. your stem cells are not are not very healthy to begin with, 
what do you think injecting or 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 introducing um, healthy, young, vibrant stem cells will do to wake up those unhealthy stem cells. I love the one thing we know about medicine is that it is designed to mimic your body's ability to heal itself. Mm -hmm. There isn't a drug that's out there. Right. Food is medicine. Movement is medicine. We'll talk about cold is medicine. Mm -hmm. Breathing is medicine. They're all ways to just help your body regenerate and that's kind of what gets me really excited and gets me excited waking up in the morning. You know, the the biggest the biggest thing that people want to avoid and this is how do I avoid surgery mm -hmm. on a you know, a knee, mm -hmm. hip, um, shoulder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sure. And uh, the concept is, hey, should I try this regenerative medicine route mm -hmm. first or is it too late? Is there like a gauge? Is there like a like a sweet spot that's in there? Well, I think there's 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 two ways of looking at it, right? So for me, I was pretty proactive about my regenerative medicine um, um, procedure, and that was because you know I knew that I had a lot of I had accumulated a lot of damage on my joints, okay. right? So I I already I had already had four surgeries. I knew for definitively I needed two more surgeries, yeah. and then at some point I was trying to delay yeah. the possibility of having to have joint replacements. Yeah. Which uh, joints, by the way? Uh, so knees and shoulders. Knees and shoulders. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, we just kind of, you know, I was like, okay, well, I need to start doing things now. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to when it's too late, that's something only a physician can can really do, and that's why you know imaging and diagnostics and all that good stuff that that has to actually happen, that has to be done under, mm -hmm. in my opinion, an MD's um, care, but. Um, you know, uh, once structural things are really broken down, yeah. it's just it's just really too difficult to be able to really you know make any improvements that that you want for the person. Right? Do you need to make lifestyle adjustments before you do regenerative medicine, or can you do make lifestyle adjustments while doing while in the program to regenerative medicine, and which is going to produce a better outcome? Mm -hmm. Right? So obviously, it, the healthier your cells are the healthier your body is gonna regenerate. Mm -hmm. There's just no doubt about it. And that's gonna come from how you deal with stress, how you deal with um, you know, nutrition, uh, hydration, sleep, right? Like all of the things that are in the world of what I did for a living, because he says I played football. In, re in reality, my job was to be to recover. Um, but, but in the world of recovery, yeah. if that person comes in, then they're usually going to do very well as long as structurally they're 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 you know sound. So every player in the NFL is a professional recoverer. Yes. <laughs> in, all, in all professional sports, I guess. In all, no, that is. So people will ask me all the time, "What was your job in the NFL?" And obviously, it. Yeah, I was a linebacker. So yeah, of course, on Sunday I'm supposed to tackle people. I'm supposed to get to the ball. Uh huh. But it was what made you a pro, what made you a, a true professional athlete, right. is the time and the duration you would take to recover. Okay. Um, from the moment you walked off the field to when you were back on again. Because remember, every single week, there's someone younger, someone faster, mm -hmm. someone who's out there to try to take your job. Mm -hmm. And the only way to continue, maintain to have a job is to be out there on the field. And that was what I took as one of my big advantages that I can always contribute to my team and to my coaching staff yeah. was the fact that I was very conscientious about recovery. Okay. And, um, and that, because I was not the most talented, I was not the fastest or the strongest or, you know, I just was, was naturally blessed with that. I just took everything I did seriously to try to gain an advantage. Right. So that way when I was on the field, hey, my my 85 percent healthy is going to be better than a the best athlete in the world 70. right and that's how and that's how you play a game right so we know that the best athletes in the world are not necessarily the fastest or strongest mm -hmm. but the most consistent right uh and then uh, they also make the players around them better absolutely you know you know in you know, basketball for example steve, steve nash is a great example right he's not the fastest nope. He's uh, certainly know, not the tallest. Certainly not the tallest, and uh, 
right? But he uh, he makes everyone around him better, and they really form uh, they form form together as a as a unit, right? Whenever we uh, view ourselves like as a human, mm -hmm. right? There's a natural strive to be to be the best at something, right? right. Absolutely. But, but in reality, even in professional sports, what it truly is is to be consistent at something, and I think that's what regenerative medicine is. I, is yep. How consistent can you be at regeneration? Mm -hmm. I'm going to relate that to a few diseases: osteoporosis, with basically bone loss. Uh, like basically, you develop these uh, these kind of holes in the bones because your body is literally chomping away at the bone more than it can build it up. Right. But the building up part is the regeneration. The chomping away is the destruction Absolutely. part. Absolutely. Right. And so, our body is going through regeneration and mm -hmm. destruction every single second. Yep. Our gut cells, our hair cells, all all these different rapidly dividing cells are going under destruction. And so there. Um, so I think what regenerative medicine is is not giving the body the ability to regenerate, but um, but helping the body to giving its tools it needs to regenerate. Absolutely. Right? So you said something earlier, there were four points, uh, I believe stress, nutrition, hydration, and sleep, right? Yeah, uh, yep. So that- Probably a couple, there are some more, but yes, yeah, so we could, and movement obviously, range of motion movement, that's a, a critical factor. Mm -hmm. Right. But yes, those are, those are the big five that we, you certainly know you need to address. Gotcha. So, um, so stress, if, if people were able to optimize stress levels, mm -hmm. nutrition, hydration, and sleep, um, that would be a really big win already just for regeneration. Without question. I mean, and not only a big win for regeneration, yeah. but then think about, you know, the effects on, you know, heart disease. Right. Think about the effects on on obesity mm -hmm. think about the effects on diabetes right right like all the big right. the big killers right. I mean it addresses all of those so what we're saying is yes absolutely regeneration right. and a regenerative pre uh, pra you know essentially medicine you know the lifestyle factors play a you know a, a tremendous importance on not only the success of the regeneration, yep. but then also we also recognize that all of those things are tied to longevity. Right, absolutely. Well, longevity is basically optimal regeneration. That's all. Exactly. You know, so the people who live longer are, are better experts at regenerating, regenerating right? Yes, absolutely. And so the regen room is really like a longevity room, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it's, really like, uh, it's really like the concept of, hey, let's prolong life and they have a really good quality of life. Right. So the concept of regeneration ties into longevity and quality of life, right? A absolutely. Which is basically everyone's pursuit. <laughs> right? Yeah, right, no, it's it's a fountain of youth. I mean, uh, think about how long we have heard about and have been chasing the fountain of youth. Right. right? Like this, this, is, this is centuries of, of right. chasing that. And, and, and the, the, it is, much of it is in our own control. Right. Right. And one of the things that we need a lot more help with, and we can maybe talk about this with the kind of what we did this past weekend, is that we, you know, we have a lot of modern issues yep. that we have to address. Ben Greenfield actually has a, a saying, I believe it's, it's his quote, not sure if it's trademarked or whatever, but, you know, he says, sometimes modern problems need ancestral solutions. Mm -hmm. And I love the mix of what we're finding out scientifically right. of what our ancestors had, all of our ancestors had done for thousands of years. And, you know, they're like, yeah, of course, right. like, you know, uh, that there's, there is a benefit of acupuncture. Yeah, go figure, right? That right. stretching is good for your body. Right. That um, meditation is really, really good at lowering inflammatory markers right. and promoting, you know, um, essentially new neural pathways that you can build in your brain. Mm -hmm. Like, these are all things that they just did it for whatever reason. They didn't have to have, you know, a researcher publish a paper on it to then recognize that this is good. They just intuitively did it. And it's interesting when we think about how far we've gotten away from just our intuition, right? So I love leading people in mm -hmm. stretching and breathing. Mm -hmm. And one thing we know for certain is they always say, man, that feels good. Why don't right. I do this more often? Right, right. Right, and, and, it, and it does feel good. Watch, watch a dog get up, watch your dog get up once they've been laying down on the ground. They're always gonna stretch first, mm -hmm. right? It feels good, but how, why, what, how have we lost that connection? 
that that connection with our body with our mind with our with our spirit and right. kind of you know where has that gone so it's not just about stem cells or prp or the procedures is the fact that there are a lot of things that we need to do on our side yep to assist on the regenerative process uh, absolutely and a lot of times if someone is leading a very destructive and not so healthy lifestyle that PRP and stem cells may not do anything, right? Absolutely, without question. And so there, the and so th that's why I like about what you do here is that you're not talking about what you do. You're talking about the the way that you should live, rather than doing procedures and stuff like that, right? And so, um, so you know, I I tell people this: the fastest way to get your natural stem cells upregulated is through fasting mm -hmm. or latest research is actually on the fasting mimicking diet yep. that's, that's actually the fastest way to get stem cell upregulation that we know of in scientific research and then um, and so whenever we go through uh, the process of um, increasing our ability to heal yep. like naturally mm -hmm. there's always destruct self-destruction first and self-destruction not necessarily a bad thing but destroying the bad self so we call it autophagy mm -hmm. auto is selfagy is like eating away so the concept of autophagy is uh is what happens when people go through different fasting states yep. and then when they're on uh, when they are uh about you know about 48 hours in at least to about 72 hours this autophagy gets up regulated and the stem cells comes in and is able to lay down these sort of new cells and then so what happens you know after the fast ends is that whatever you're eating whatever you're thinking whatever you're if you're mm -hmm. uh, breathing you're actually refeeding those new cells right and when you feed those new cells your body knows exactly how to regenerate yep right when you combine that with what uh, all the stuff you do here i think that's where the most important portion is right so it's funny you said that without yeah. question yeah and, and one of the things that that, yeah. I, that i really appreciate and again why you right. know i was like doc absolutely i would love to i would love to work with you here at the region room yeah was because if you're unwilling to want to make basically get on board the program yeah the regen the regen program so the regen, lifestyle the, plus uh, coaching some mindset type stuff yeah. if you're unwilling to then that's just like look it's not saying you're not a candidate for agenda medicine it's just we don't want to work with you here yeah uh, we're going to choose not to work with you here because, you know, outcomes matter the most. Um, uh, it's a partnership, right? It's a partnership. We're going to work yeah. together and you, and you got to do your part as well and accountability. Right. And so the, the, the one thing that is just so much fun to kind of to see is people just be like, yes, they're ready and they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you actually talked about that was very interesting is the fast mimicking mm -hmm. because uh, we've you know read a ton of that research as well. It's amazing, it's phenomenal. Yeah. And um, one of the things that we kind of would love to try to introduce mm -hmm. um, is that exactly that, do the injections on day four. Yeah, so the fast mimicking <laughs> diet is, um, this isn't a book, it's a great book called The Longevity Diet. Um, and um, The Longevity Diet is written by a uh, scientist, his name is Walter Longo, he's an Italian guy. Um, and this talks about the science behind fasting, the mm -hmm. history behind fasting, fasting mimicking diet, and the history behind uh, basically what people are doing in the blue zones of the earth, mm -hmm. the, the areas in the, in the, in the world were the most centenarians, so yep. basically people living a uh, hundred or above. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. uh, what are they breathing? How, what water are they drinking? And so there's a consistency about what everyone's doing, and actually it starts with those four things. There's stress management or mindfulness, yep. I call it, right? Um, uh, diets uh, that are high in uh, uh, pl uh, plant-based diet in right. terms of plant nutrition earlier on in life and actually higher in meat and protein diets later on in life like mm. after age 65 or 70 right so these are people who actually live the longest um, so I thought that was interesting I've never heard that before and the fact that people who go through periodic fasting actually has different um, genes that get turned on to express these anti-aging and longevity uh, genes and phenotypes right so phenotype basically is the the term where you have these genes and you are you, your body can actually express those genes or turn on those genes um, so through the fasting mimicking diet um, it's it, we we started learning that our body can actually regenerate 
a lot more than we thought. And so through, and then now there's studies comparing that to actual fasting and, uh, and uh, very uh, restricted, low caloric restriction. Mm -hmm. um, and then comparing that to water fast and full fast. So a lot of the studies that were looking at different populations came from people observing Ramadan mm -hmm. uh, originally. Uh, and were and a lot of studies have been designed from those original studies and, and were put into some animal studies looking at the regenerative process right. for those animals going through either fasting or fasting mimicking diet. And so there are mice studies, mice models, looking at actual regeneration of the colon with mice models of like ulcerative colitis. Right. There are mice models uh, looking at the re regeneration of the pancreas mm -hmm. of those with pancreatic destruction for type 1 diabetes. And also another one for multiple sclerosis. This mm -hmm. is all in 2019. Absolutely, yeah. And so what's amazing is that, I mean, there weren't any medicines given to these mice because medicines don't regenerate anything. Right. That we know that, and no medicine does. And not only do medicines not regenerate, can cause a lot of destruction. So these mice were just giving either fasting or fasting mimicking, and they we're seeing results uh, from that. Right. And then, of course, there's new studies that are coming out, too, uh, especially in the first quarter of 2020, which I cannot tell you about, but I know about them. <laughs> uh, but maybe when that time happens, I'll do a video on it. That looks at so many different disease states and these disease states have a regenerative component to it, right. uh, but our body's ability to regenerate is uh, is fascinatingly improved. Yes, I love these studies, and I love yeah. reading these studies, and kind of before when we were talking about just how long, it, when I was first introduced to PRP and when it got to us, a lot of this sometimes to me is like, well, of course, like, duh. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's so much research that is in, tells me, is like, yeah. like, yeah, that's good for you. So, I mean, the, like, something that we we talk about all the time at the athletic room, which is the, the business next door that's all around recovery and body maintenance, right. is that our bodies, you know, like, it is built in our DNA, in our cells, to essentially have to deal with a couple things. One is sometimes a scarcity of calories, Right. The other one is essentially have to deal with environmental elements, right. both heat and cold, uh -huh. both of which in our modern lifestyle have been completely eliminated. <laughs> with air conditioning heaters? With air conditioning <laughs> heaters and, you know, a uh, gas station that has um, fast food or, yeah. you know, 24 hours a day. Right. And so, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes, you know, like of course there's no doubt about it there's just, there and, and so it's really fun that's what i that's what really geeks me out that's what gets me excited is when we talked about earlier about the stuff that our ancestors did that they did and now science is able to back it up and prove why it works mm -hmm. like that's it's beautiful and that's what yeah. gets me really really excited and that's why the power of the body to regenerate is is just is amazing and that's why right. medicine is only trying to do that figure out how does the body actually do it naturally and now let's do it you know pharmaceutically right or you know in this case definitely through food mimicking the way our our ancestors would have eaten yeah so especially like the the recent the human trial even the human studies that were done on basically um, doing a five-day caloric restriction uh, called the fasting mimicking diet uh, once a month for, uh, for, for three months and they mm -hmm. did blood work before and after. There's stabilization of uh, inflammation markers, metabolic markers, and things that we don't expect to change very much in just right. three months right. of someone just doing a caloric restriction for five days and eating regular for three weeks. Wow. Caloric restriction for five days, eating regular for three weeks and caloric restriction for five days. In my head, I was like, that's not going to do anything. I was proven wrong. <laughs> That's awesome. And and this is what we see, right? So three point three trillion, you know, spent a year uh, in in just in just medicine and chronic disease, actually. Yeah, yeah. Alone. Well, and, because eight out of the ten reasons we go to the doctor and yeah. or or essentially die are chronic related, right? Right. And so these chronic disease, by for example, all chronic disease by definition is the inability for regeneration. Right. That's what chronic disease is, right? And so it's not just a dis-ease, it's, it's really a dis-regeneration. Right. Um, and so I think we really have to look at, you know, regenerative and regenerative medicine from a very holistic standpoint, which yeah. is what you do. 
and I really appreciate that because honestly most people don't and uh, a lot of people who do regenerative medicine I think a lot more focus needs to be f needs to be really surrounding the things that you focus on right uh, you know stress uh, nutrition hydration movement and sleep right uh, big five? That's, the big, right. that's a big five yeah we'll, uh, we'll stop there for now but those are the major big five yeah right? yeah we just know that right there you know how you breathe can you can you can reduce your your inflammatory markers and your blood pressure and just right. through what five breaths I think one Japanese study had it was five belly breaths yes. could reduce your blood pressure and, and kind of your 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 cortisol levels um, you know sleep where does regeneration happen it's when, sleep. when you're sleeping yep so if you're not sleeping well then of course you know it's going to be very difficult for your body to regenerate um, that is something that is taking the elite athletes world by storm is just the science that's going into yep. and the technology going into making sure recovery happens and primarily starting with sleep right. nutrition if you're not feeding your cells well again how do you expect for them to you know respond um, and something else that we kind of talked about when we talk about movement or exercise and that type of stuff we know that not all stress is bad right yeah, you, chronic stress is bad chronic right. stress is terrible right but stress our body is made for stress right body, to adapt short bursts short bursts of stress mm -hmm. which is essentially what a fast mimicking diet is doing exactly you're 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 making your you can think yep. of it like a, a like you're going to the gym mm -hmm. is is pretty much what you're doing to yourselves mm -hmm. and you're making them stronger it's so much fun and it's in some ways sometimes it's just kind of obvious Right, like I mean, yeah. I know it's not necessarily obvious, and, and but but you just yeah. think about it logically. You're like, of course. Once you hear it, you're kind of like, of course. Why wouldn't it work that way? Well, right. We you know, know about our bodies, but yeah. it is hard to put, connect those dots. And then obviously, you know, the one thing that that you have to be do, is sure of is you know doing the proper research. Yeah. And and all of that good stuff, which is which is awesome that you know you're kind of a part of this and doing stuff like that. You know, I have very specific conditions that I know from my body where I'm gonna seek out acupuncture. Right. And then I have other ones where I'm like, oh yeah, that's a massage. Okay. You know, and you feel that. Um, but obviously there's, that's a lot of trial and error. Right, and, absolutely. And everyone doesn't have that opportunity to be able to do that. That's it. So earlier you talked about hot and cold extremes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. right? And so just a couple of days ago, uh, we were in his pool and it was freezing. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's freezing for Texas. Yeah. It was 35 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. We went into the pool, and I guess we spent like five, six minutes that we yep. were in there. And uh, and everyone knows, even my wife knows, like I hate differences of temperatures on my skin. I've always hated it. And it kind of freaked me out in the very beginning, but I went through it. And so um, that's a very extreme form of cryotherapy, I think. Yes. Um, but people do get cryotherapy. Uh, so but let's first of all, let's have you define what cryotherapy is. Mm -hmm. Number two, what it really does. Okay. So when we talk about whole body cryotherapy, and that's, that is kind of what we have next door at the athletic room, is whole body cryotherapy is essentially using nitrogen to cool the skin. Okay. So in the, the reason why we use that is because it's a much quicker um, response that because it's almost as though we're using your skin and your skin sensors mm -hmm. to trigger a response so the same duration in a cold tub as an i would have done when i was an athlete would have been about 15 to 20 minutes you can do this in about three minutes mm -hmm. so one of the things that it was actually originally created late late 70s um it came out of japan and it was a doctor for rheumatoid arthritis okay and how he was using, and it's actually very interesting because everyone just hears rheumatoid arthritis, you think inflammation, and you think that's the only reason. There is, that is part of the reason. But the second part of the reason is he would actually use this before um, manual therapies. Okay. And so, you know, just even anecdotally here, working with athletes, working with guys coming off of surgeries, Tommy John's, that type of stuff, we can actually see before and after um, um, changes in you know whatever whatever we're measuring extension or flexion um, a range based, of motion right? a range of motion um, based off of you know pre and post cryotherapy and so um, you know there's there's a number of factors that are happening but one of them is just kind of resetting the nervous system mm -hmm. so when I was a pro athlete the one thing that I, we did every single day 
uh, was to get in the cold tub. Mm -hmm. Why we would do it is because, you know what? We just felt better the next day. Mm -hmm. So I've had cold as a part of my regiment for a, for a really long time. Um, what's so fun is once I got out of it and I kind of had lost access to 20, you know, 24 seven year round um, cold tubs because mm -hmm. you know, look, I'm gonna be honest. I'm lazy and hauling 20 bags of ice <laughs> up to my up to my upstairs, right. so like throwing my bathtub. It just was getting annoying, and right. it would actually cost me a fortune. Yeah. Um, was just the science behind it, right? Um, what it does to your insulin levels, for example, very similar, to, uh, like very similar to fasting. Mm -hmm. what, um, um, what it does to your hormone levels. So both testosterone and growth hormones will increase from, from essentially being cold or shivering. Metabolically, shivering, when you, when you talk about, about being cold, metabolically, 15 minutes of shivering is better than 60 minutes of high intensity exercise. So you can actually... 15 or 50 minutes of shivering? 15. 15 minutes One, of shivering is better than what? 60 minutes of high intensity exercise. Calorically. Calorically speaking? Calorically speaking, you will burn more calories that way because cold, just like exercise, right. essentially will, will, will basically rob your muscles or take glycogen from your muscles. Okay. And once you deplete that glycogen, that's when all these hormones start kicking in. Growth mm -hmm. factors, uh, our, our, uh, um, growth hormone, yeah. uh, testosterone, all this type of stuff. And so there was actually a really fun l scientist in the 70s that discovered when these astronauts were coming back, just what happened to them physiologically. Okay. And the only correlation they could find in the world was the Sherpas. Right, and they're after isolating a whole number of different factors. They, it basically was they both had extreme cold temperatures that their body had to adapt to. The astronauts and the Sherpas. The astronauts and the Sherpas. Okay, what what, what do they find in the astronauts that they want to study them? So they want they found essentially an increase in 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 just basically their metabolic rate. Okay. Um, uh, increase in VO two maxes. Okay. Um, and an increase in brown adipot at brown fat adipose tissue right so keep define vo2 max absolutely so basically it is how i think of it as a lame person if you start running yeah and you run consistently right and now you could run a little bit faster and a little bit longer yeah that is an increase to your vo2 max okay just simply simply stated right okay. like that's and it is stamina stamina the ability for your body to essentially um, um, use oxygen and essentially um, perform work. Okay. Turn it into energy. Okay. But these right? astronauts were had improved. Had improved uh, efficiency of work. Absolutely. Well, I would think that has something to do with gravity. Uh, you, you would you would think that yeah there were a lot of factors that they were looking at. Yeah. But they're improved. If anyone knows about the Sherpas, right? Yeah. Um, and just their athletic feats that they're able to do. You know, typically you say, okay, a Sherpa, you know, he goes and he can, he can basically say someone climb, is, wants to go climb Mount Everest. Yeah. It's, you know, they may be training for five years, six years, seven years to build up the ability to deal like with. Like a normal person. Yeah. yeah. Altitude and yeah. all that stuff. Sherpas, but it takes them still about three weeks yeah. to acclimate to base camp. Okay, right. Sherpas do. No, no. A regular, average person, regular person who's well trained endurance athlete. Okay. A Sherpa, by and large, doesn't train. Yeah. Right? Like, like they're not really, that's not really, they're not, that's just, that's a job, is what they do. And they adapt in about three days. I feel like they should play on the Texans. Uh, I, I feel, <laughs> yeah, especially in the fourth quarter. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we've been good in the fourth quarter lately. I'm, I, you know, I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah. But you know, and so, 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 what they're able to do with their bodies in essentially cardiovascular yeah. is is it doesn't make sense, right? Um, so there's there was a, a very a, a great scientist that came out of NASA that basically created a cold adaptation program right. based around essentially what he learned while working at NASA about the astronauts, the Sherpas, and how the body performs. And it's it's very fascinating. Okay, so, but they're exposed to this cold. Yes. Right? And so, I mean, there's there's different cultures that are exposed to cold, right? Like the, um, uh, the Alaskans mm -hmm. and Eskimos and... Uh, 
and what's interesting is that they have different percentages of, uh, of brown fat right right and uh, b you know babies are born with brown fat so they can utilize as the energy very readily mm -hmm. to develop resilience when they're younger which kind of goes away as you age um, but and, and one of the big questions around brown fat just yeah. that's exactly how it is is that for a long time people just thought we didn't need it didn't need brown fat didn't yeah. need brown fat right it was only till recently in the in the in the teens i guess that we could actually start imaging for it it was when better um you know cancer screening yeah. imaging could sh could show up and what they found is that oh some adults do have it but the only only the adults right. that have exposure to cold exposure to cold right exactly right? and so and so and so there's there's kind of a longevity and regeneration uh, mechanism that's kind of built into that absolutely right? uh, now the these astronauts that went into space didn't have brown fat no but they had exposure to cold absolutely so it's not the brown fat then it's basically some exposure to cold mm -hmm. or or maybe uh the the lack of gravity and the combination of different things and maybe the way they're eating because astronauts have to eat very for healthy sure. for training yeah. and so there's something about that that turned their metabolic mechanisms on absolutely uh th um, through through uh affecting their genetics called epigenetics uh, that allow them to have a very uh, very similar profile as to someone who's living in the cold on Earth with brown fat at high altitude. Uh, absolutely, high altitude. Yep. And so, and you know, being being that we currently are in Houston, we're at sea level, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Do we need high altitude to achieve this? No, you actually don't. Um, there's actually some really good breathing techniques that instead of having to, because the, the again. Well, breathing is much cheaper than going to a house. It is much cheaper <laughs> and, and it's way, way more convenient. Yeah. Um, because what, you know, what we have learned, and this is, comes out of all the performance yeah. enhancing type of stuff, is that, you know, the best way to increase essentially your abilities to, your body's ability to oxygenate it, and in, especially under performance, is to live high and train low. Right, so if you ever hear the adage of you know an elite athlete, he wants to live you know somewhere in high elevation, maybe like Mexico City, and train somewhere at low elevation, oh, okay. you know, kind of near like because you know that that translates to you get the best of both worlds. Right. So in since you can't do that, one of the things you can do is just simply do some breath work because it's the idea of bringing the mountain to you. So do you remember those big masks that people were wearing? It was kind of in vogue a couple years ago. For training. For altitude training, yeah, yeah. you know, like in the gym or whatever. That's essentially what they were, that's what they were trying to do. But so, you can also just do it by holding your breath. You can do it by holding your breath. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, you know, you could do it that way, but you could also do it by holding your breath. And the reason why they're doing it, and the reason why it's so important in sports is, uh, UT Dallas did a study and they took 1500 meter collegiate runners they took them for a month and they they all trained together yeah so high level guys very fit all trained together in um in dallas so they were doing all their work they broke them up into two groups one group did the training and then had 20 minutes of breath hold exercise breath exercises a day the other group just did the training the group that did the breath hold exercises actually increased their red blood cell count by 9%, mm -hmm. which translated into an increase of their VO2 max by, I believe it was 5%. Okay. Versus the other control group, so right? They have better stamina. So better stamina, yeah. more efficiency, and more yeah, efficiency. they can create more work. Okay. Yeah. Well, so we don't need the high elevation, but maybe you need some cold, yep. right? Um, but what about what about extreme heat? Like those people who go to like infrared mm -hmm. saunas mm -hmm. for extended mm -hmm. period of time. What is the difference between something like that right. and exposure to cold like cryotherapy? Right. So that's the beauty of it because I'm a huge advocate of both. Uh -huh. Again, when we talked about our bodies were originally developed to deal with extremes, right. environmental extremes. Um, you know, there's something that's kind of fun. This is kind of the research nerd piece that, that I'm getting into and I really enjoy as more and more research comes out and people start finding this is there's cold shock proteins and there's also heat shock proteins. That's right. Yeah. And that, you know, and essentially by and large, they kind of do the same thing. Right. So basically cold shock proteins are exposed to cold and uh, these proteins uh, start having a metabolic actively signaling, right. uh, which allows other things to happen. And heat shock proteins, or HSPs, 
uh, HSPs also do very similar things, but under extreme heat. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, a lot of them do very similar things, but some of them do very, yeah, very opposite things. Yeah. Um, but there's always a, a mechanism that can get turned on for regeneration mm -hmm. after cold shock or heat shock. Absolutely. And so, you know, for so I, you know, when people go through cryotherapy, I do consider that cold shock. Yep. But heat shock is kind of different because if they go into like a sauna or infrared sauna. They're in there for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. maybe 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. right? And then their sweating process starts. And when you sweat, by the way, you start detoxing uh, a lot of what's in the capillaries yep. that's underneath the skin, which kind of draws a lot of toxins to the skin and you sweat it out. And uh, you start moving your fluid around, which has its own really good benefits. Absolutely. So I think extreme cold mm -hmm. and heat has, has their benefits. So the people who get out of cryotherapy, right. they're ready to go. No doubt about it. They're like, my day is set. Yep. Um, I'm less pain or even pain free, like right. I was in my in my hip after we we got into that cold cold pool and got out. The people who uh, who go through infrared saunas is like, ah, okay, I'm not ready to do anything yet. I just want to chill out for a second. Uh -huh. I'm going to hydrate and regenerate on that side. Makes sense, right? And so I think um, I think the people who go through cryotherapy mm. have that shock. Right. Basically, it's like I'm looking at a tiger in the face, and after I get out of cryotherapy, I already killed the tiger. Right. So I'm good. Yeah. If I kill the tiger, my stress level is gone. Yeah. Right. Whereas the um, whereas people who are exposed to the heat, uh, who are exposed to the infrared saunas, what's happening is is like, it's like a detoxification period, mm -hmm. and in a detoxification period, the body ha is allowed to go through its own type of stress, mm -hmm. but uh, it's got it's got its own level of recovery as well. Yeah. So I do l enjoy both. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of, there are a couple. It is it's a, the heat is definitely a lot more gentler mm -hmm. in some cases. Yeah. But the studies, it's funny because. It's not any easier. You know, everyone just automatically assumes that it's, oh, well, it's heat, I like the heat, um, it's gonna be easier. Right. Because, you know, the best longevity studies, that, or at least the ones that I had read about saunas, now this is not about infrared saunas, it's just about saunas in general. It was 17 minutes or more at 171 or above. Wow. Right, and that is, that's a mental challenge as well. Yeah, it, 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 was, it is not, you know, the getting out and then getting back in because you actually have to get to the point right. of this kind of this stressful event. But I want everyone to just listen to your body. Like if your body think, likes something, then, then do it, <laughs> you know, um, so not in a very destructive way, obviously. But, um, you know, if your body likes cryo, then do it. If your body likes infrared sound, do it. If your body likes an alternating process, then do it. And everyone's different. Yep. Everyone is on a spectrum. And I call it the toxicity spectrum. Mm -hmm. Some people are more toxic than others. They might be smokers. They might live in areas of the city where there's a lot of pollution. Mm -hmm. They might not have the best diets, right? And so everyone's on a spectrum. And uh, it's, I will tell you, it's really impossible to determine where on the spectrum you are until you start doing things for yourself. Right that are healthy, like changing the way you eat, and you're like, oh my God, I'm, I'm healthier, but I have a lot of sugar cravings, right? That's like, okay, well, we're this, we're, well there's a toxicity that needs to be, to be overcome. Yep. Or that um, if I go through uh, infrared saunas and all of a sudden I'm getting more congested, right? There's toxicities that are leached through the skin and sweat out infrared saunas, and that can bring into the blood flow. There's people who go through cryotherapy and they may not even feel anything, right? And they may not have this, uh, this awesome experience so it's a very individualized yes, approach, but, f but for everyone, but for everyone, the foundation is still the big five that you talked about, yep. right? Stress, nutrition, hydration, sleep, and movement, right? The big yep. five. The big five. These big five is the fundamental of all regeneration, mm -hmm. and everything else is just bonus. Absolutely. Fasting, right? Yep, absolutely. It, it has to start there. It has to start Right? It, it has to start with a strong foundation, because after right. that, these are all just tools. I mean, just even think about the idea of a supplement. Right. Like we know that a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D, right. uh, B, some some uh, B, you know, or omegas, that type of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's still the word supplement means in addition to, correct, not in place of, right. And I think that's kind of where sometimes we we kind of get. We, we, we just trick ourselves into thinking, oh, well, I'm doing my recovery, 
so I don't need to sleep as much. That's not, that's not the point. We want you to sleep just as much and we want you to do your recovery right. because then we know that your body is in its optimal state. And so that's kind right. of the, the big message that we, that we say. I have a, I have a personal motto um, that is very similar to what you said is, you know, if you listen to your body mm -hmm. when it whispers at you, you can avoid it screaming at you because at the end of the day once it's screaming at you you have a lot less options when it's whispering modalities like infrared cryotherapy um uh, qigong tai chi um acupuncture mm -hmm. stretching breathing. yoga <laughs> breathing they're all available they all can work yeah. when it's screaming at you some high level drugs potential surgery there's just not a lot left Right. And so that's what we want to try to do is be an active participant in our health, our wellness, and stay ahead of it. And that's why I did my regenerative medicine procedure was to do that, to be ahead of it so that it didn't get to a point where I just couldn't do stuff anymore. I, I right. couldn't be the person that, that you know, I identify with, which is, which is an athlete for life. Well, what are some of those whispers that are really common we're talking about? Lower back pain. Lower back, uh, huh? right? Uh, yeah. the, one of the most common whispers that we see here at the athletic room is, you know, people dealing with lower back pain. A lot of people have lower back pain. Yep. Um, another one, shoulder, shoulder range of motions around shoulders yep. and knees. Mm -hmm. um, super common that we. That's kind of what we deal with a lot here. Um, you know, and then you get into kind of more the, uh, what you would say, fuzzy ones like uh, around. Uh, anxiety mm -hmm. or um, just feeling insomnia, insomnia Sleep is lack of energy, mm -hmm. um, these things that, you know, all are controlled by your nervous system. Mm -hmm. Many of them are controlled by your nervous system. And well, they, all are. Yeah, they all are. They all are. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. basically, yeah, good point. Everything is. Yeah. Um, and, and, and many of these things, you can, you can start trying things like, like you were saying is you, you try. What has worked? What made you feel just a little bit better? Okay, let's throw the one that made you feel terrible out, but one that made you feel good. Maybe let's you know, commit a little bit more and like, let's explore this a little bit. And that's what I'm always doing with my body. That's what every pro athlete is always doing with their body is trying to you know, implement things in their life that they can honestly just stick with because they enjoy it. So how do you get guided in something like this? Because there's so many things on the internet mm -hmm. and half of it's not true mm -hmm. and the other half may be true, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But we don't really know yet. Mm -hmm. And so there's uh, there's so many fuzzies that are out there, Absolutely. right? If you look at cookbooks, paleo, keto, vegan, you know, Mark Hyman calls it vegan, eat fat, get thin, you have the carnivore diet, you have the, the paleo uh, slow cooker book, book, there's everything that's there, right? And if you look at different books that are out there, um, there's books on plant-based diets, right. uh, paleo diets, and, uh, and keeping you know, lectins out, and, and all. There's, there's a lot of conflicting data. There is a lot. No, they sell books it's really confusing. well. It's yeah. confusing, they sell books really well. But here's, here's the thing that all books have in common, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the timing of eating should be during the daytime. Yep. All right? And then also, uh, what all books have in common is that you should be getting a variety of different foods of different colors in the spectrum of the rainbow. Not the, all good, the, the good books yeah. all have that. Because right. you could argue that some of maybe some of the carnivore ones right. don't. Maybe that, that, that might right. be the exception. Right. Um, but, uh, but, but all that does is tells us that there is a lot of scientific research mm -hmm. under the foundation, the principle that we should be getting that as part of our nutrition yep. and the time of eating during the daytime, right? And then also that periodic fasting in most books I've read uh, have been shown to have a, a very, very good benefit, cardiovascular markers, longevity, and all the stuff like that. And, uh, and the principle of sleep and stress yeah. is, is, is very important as well. So I think a lot of these books have that in common and that's why I really promote is like, hey, let's, let's look, look at the fundamental principles Absolutely. and keep it simple. Uh, yeah, so so ex with it, without question. So how I l personally look at all the different diets, there are, look, I get it. I get if you're going to go keto, why you're going to lose weight. You are going to lose weight, yeah. but you're also going to you're also going to increase some risks for a lot of other stuff. Um, I was talking to Roberta Anding, who is you know the Astros mm -hmm. nutritious and yeah. uh, does some counter Gatorade and rice, 
and Jesus is talking about I can't remember exactly what disease, but the rise in that in that particular disease um, because of keto diet. I subscribe to this idea as the the, the common sense idea of I love the the tra- I love the yin and the yang mm-hmm. traditional Chinese medicine, mm-hmm. and I love this idea of moderation and and that excess is just equally as bad as deficiency mm-hmm. and that your body is trying to trying to find balance and maintain balance let's just think about something as simple as our ph levels right right we're trying to maintain the 7.365 and what i love is this this idea of if you want to eat healthy by and large it boils down to this eat like you're poor in another country <laughs> That's really good, right? Yeah. If you eat like you're poor in another right. country, right? Then you it's basically covered everything. It's vegetables and ancient grains, basically, right? And so with <laughs> mixing some proteins in yeah. there when you need to, exactly. And it's during the day because you don't have all the excess calories right. to eat at night. That's exactly <laughs> what the you know the book, the longevity diet, actually talks about. Is that during these earlier times, uh, these people who live the longest mm-hmm. uh, are very low protein. Uh, eating uh, all spectrums of different colors of the rainbow in terms of phytonutrients. Yep. Uh, but there's nothing necessarily in excess um, and until they get older. Then they have they have uh, availability of high protein foods and stuff like that. Right. But you're absolutely right. You know, and I think there's a downfall of every uh, every you know sort of fad diet out there. Right. Um, and paleo, for example. So American Heart Association came out with a study that people who uh, pay, uh, who went paleo after the first month had increased risk of heart disease or heart attacks, right? And that's really because most of the grains they were getting were from bread. <laughs> so, but then if you put if you put fiber into the diet, so if you put um, so basically these people are only getting fiber mm-hmm. from the bread from the grains, right? Um, because they traditionally have a low vegetable intake, anyways. Right. If you take that out, that protective mechanism is gone. So there's nothing wrong going paleo as long as you you support the whole thing with uh, with uh, fiber, insoluble fiber, which is in a lot of plants, leafy greens, leafy purples or reds, whatever it is, right? And so, like your breakfast this morning. Yeah, exactly. it was. It was it's a, on my Instagram. It, it's on your Instagram. Yeah. It was a perfect breakfast. Yeah, it was colorful. Yeah, it's colorful. I, I love the idea of just eating color. Yeah, so. eat color and make them. You know, yeah. right? Sorry to interrupt. No, that's good. That's good. But if we know all this, mm-hmm. if we know all this, if I go to elementary school, mm-hmm. how many colors are in the lunch? Yeah. If I go to a really really expensive restaurant like that one down the street over there. What do the kids' menu look like? Yeah, it, How colorful is it? It's the same thing. And so there's this there's this idea that we know of what's healthy, right? But when we treat children and looking at the food in the school lunches, mm-hmm. it's really devoid of a lot of color. Even if there is color, um, there's maybe some fruits and high fructose corn syrup in a fruit right. Fruit it's, cup. it's artificial. It's not natural. Right. And so we know that that creates its own level of inflammatory problems. So I think the attitude of how we treat food in the country mm-hmm. um, starts with what we see in, in school lunches, what mm-hmm. we see in the kids' menu. Uh, and, you know, I have I've one in kindergarten and one in, one in pre-K. So, you know, and a lot of things, these, these bother me, right? So, um, and so, but, but that's how we view convenience. We view kids as always uh, as a little bundle of joy right. until they grow up. And it's, it's a bundle of inconvenience. And so everything to make this convenient is now the culture, yeah. which is food devoid of colors. Yes. Which is, you know, you have the mac and cheese and the, fi- and the fish sticks or, the, or the whatever. Please feed your children really good food. I know they don't want it in the very beginning, but they will crave it after a while. I mm-hmm. know my kids do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but these are, these are the basic fundamental principles of regenerative medicine. Mm-hmm. Agree? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Nice. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks.